Thank you again for joining us this morning for this morning Bible study. Please join me as we sing, I'll live in glory, I'll live in glory. I like to stay here longer than men's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by, I'll tell and sing love stories. There on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory. By and by, I want to be of service along this pilgrim way and lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray. As day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever and I and live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love story there on high, there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing, by faith I look away to yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I'll cling to him forever and look beyond the sky and spend the endless ages in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love stories there on high there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell and sing love stories there on high, there with my dear Redeemer. No more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. Amen. 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 Good to see everybody this morning on this cold, bright Lord's Day. But it's warm in here. Amen. So we're going to hurry again and get started because, you know, sometimes what's good goes a little over. So I want to try again as much as I can before my time is up, but we have a lot to talk about, but I don't want to go too fast, but I want to be able to say just enough to help us as parents and future parents and grandparents on how to deal with our children, especially helping them to set their boundaries because children are fragile and they are the most important thing, or I wouldn't say thing, but they are the most important person that God has blessed us to have. Because you have to understand, and we all are stewards of our children. And we got to give an account on how we have the stewardship over our children. Because our children have no guidance when they're born. You never seen a baby come out of the womb talking or walking but they need guidance, they need training. And as a parent, that's what our responsibility is, is to train them so they can become responsible adults. So what is the main goal of a parent? What is the main goal of a parent? All right, if you can just raise your hand. And uh, brothers, if I can get somebody with a mic, because I know there are some good information that you can share with the whole class. 
What's the main goal of a parent? Better steward. Okay, that's good, All right? But really the main purpose of parenting is not only having them to have a relationship with God, but the main goal of parenting your child is to help them to survive when you're gone. How many of you have witnessed children who couldn't function when their parents passed away? Our main goal is to help our children, no matter how close you are to them, that when I'm gone, you can still survive. And if you help them with their boundaries, they can. Sure, they're going to go through the grief. That's normal. But it's not going to be the morbid grief where they can't do anything else because they're still stuck on the loss of mom or dad. I had that conversation with my mother because I had a friend who lost their mother. And I was talking to her, and I said, Mom, so-and-so lost their mother. And I don't know what I would do if something happened to you. You know what she said to me? She said, you'll be all right, because your wife would take my place. I looked at her, I said, what? (laughs) But it is true. Your wife could be a comfort. Remember Isaac when he lost his mother? Remember that story? Who comforted Isaac? Who comforted Isaac? Come on, Bible students. Rebecca did. His wife comforted him when Sarah passed away. Well, that's the same as parents. But pair your children so that when something happens to you, they will be okay and move on. So today, let me see if my PowerPoint is working because there's a lot I like to cover. Okay, that's working good. Let's see. Let's see if I can get up to right there. The boundary needs of children. Self-protection, taking responsibility for one's needs, having a sense of control and chores, delaying gratifications of goals, and respecting the limits of others. And so as we are training our children and really getting to know our children, there's one thing we're going to talk about later is knowing the temperament of your child. Each child is different. Everybody in this room, I I can say, or surely if you are a parent, you have at least one child. Now, that's one way uh, you say, well, I only got one child that I had to groom and grow and so forth. But what if you have more than one child? Like I said earlier in my lesson, raising children is not like a cookie cutter. You cannot train the same child, the firstborn, the same all the way down to the lastborn because each child is different because of their temperament. So we got Brother McKinley's going to be reading with us, reading for us today, and we're going to begin on page 174 at the bottom, the boundary needs of children. And see, children need boundaries. Don't think that a child is like you have your pets. You know, you can have an animal or a pet, and it'll be fine by itself if you don't spend time training it. But children need boundaries because they need to understand and know what is right and what is wrong. And they only get it from the teaching of those that are raising them. And that's why some children, they grow up doing wrong things because that's all the teaching that they had. And then there's those who grow up to do things that are right because of the teaching that they were exposed to. Because remember the three E's that we talked about? Your example, your environment, and your experience. Those three elements determine how a child would develop into an adult. But you as the parent, 
your responsibility to make sure they have the best to be raised and to grow up in. And it's not, you may not be able to give them everything that they want, but you as a parent, that's usually our attitude. I want you to have better than what I had. But Brother McKinley, let's go ahead and start reading, my brother. What specific needs do boundaries meet in our kids? Limit setting abilities have several important jobs that will pay enormous dividends throughout life. Self-protection. Have you ever seen any, anything more helpless than the human infant? Human babies are less able to take care of themselves than animal babies. God designed a newborn months as a, mean, as a means for the mother and father or another caregiver to connect deeply with their infant, knowing that without their minute-by-minute -minute care, the baby would not survive. All this time and energy translates into an enduring attachment in which the child learns to feel safe in the world. Because see, a baby has no defense mechanism when they're born. The only protection that a baby has is its mother or its guardian. And that's why the babies are so fragile. And that's why it's important that we start, as soon as they're born, training our children. Now, I'm not going to profess that I'm an expert because sometimes, you know how you say, I wish I know then what I know now. No, I don't know everything, but what I have learned, I want to share it with others, and especially those who are parents and those who prayerfully one day will be a parent. So one thing about raising children, it's something that you don't graduate from. Even when they become adults, they still your child. And they'll come to you at times, even as an adult. But if you have that relationship, you will never, well, you won't have the, the fear that they'll never come to you when there's a problem that they can talk about that will lead to consequences if they make the wrong choice. Because you, as an adult, how many, and if your parents are still alive, how many of you still talk to your parents about some decision that you are thinking about making? Yeah, because you still have that relationship because of how your parent grew or trained you as a young baby going up into an adult, having that kind of relationship. And see, we talked about the relationship with your children. When they become adults, they will still call mom and dad. But sometimes when you don't have that relationship, you got children who say, I can't wait to get out of here. And how many of us thought like that? I can't wait. To, hey, are you shaking your head? Yes. <laughs> you have them 18. I can't wait to get out of here. And then when they get out there, oh, I wish I was back home. Now, how many of you thought that? I wish I was back home. Because like I tell you, collard green sandwich do not taste good, especially when they come out of a can. But those are because of sometimes we take our relationship with our parents for granted. But you have to de let them develop on their, de you know, experience it. We can't be so protective that we shield our children from everything. You can't do that. It's just like a caterpillar who eventually goes into a cocoon to develop to become a butterfly. You have to let them work through sometimes their difficulties so they can become strong to come out of their cocoon to be a butterfly. Same way with a chicken and an egg. You have to let that chicken peck its way out of that egg to develop the strength. Let's continue, Brother McKinley. God's program of maturation. However, doesn't stop there. Mom and dad can't always be there to care and provide. The task of protection needs to ultimately pass on to the children. When they grow up, they need to protect themselves. Boundaries are our, boundaries are our way of protecting and safeguarding our souls. Boundaries are designed to keep the good in and the bad out. And skills such as saying no, telling the truth, 
and maintaining physical distance need to be developed in the family structure to allow the child to take on the responsibility of self-protection. Consider the following two 12-year-old boys. Now, right there, let's hold it right there. We're gonna look at a scenario, two 12-year-old boys, and they're both are coming from Christian homes. So here, we have to help the child to develop their boundaries to say no when it's time to say no. And we're gonna talk later uh, time permits about the temperaments of children and how the different temperaments of the children also you can tell how they are in I would say society or among their peers because children are like clay you can easily mold them but once they become hard what can you do with hard clay can't do nothing with hard clay Brother McKinnon, let's continue. Jimmy is talking with his parents at the dinner table. Guess what? Some kids wanted me to smoke pot with them. When I told them I didn't want to, they said I was a sissy. I told them they were dumb. I like some of them, but if they can't like me because I don't smoke pot, I guess they aren't really my friends. Now, right here, now, you said Gene, or the book says Jack. I'm sorry. My, uh, I have the online version. Well, these, uh, these are two boys. Jimmy. Mine says Jimmy. <laughs> well, we're talking about we're Jack. So Jack is, is, is experiencing peer pressure in school. And the peer pressure is, hey, let's smoke some weed. Let's smoke some pot. But his home training is telling him no. Brother Atkins, yes, can you bring up 1 Corinthians 15, 33 for me? Because, see, you have to teach your children. You don't have to do what everybody around you say to do. But do you know why the children do that? Because they want to be accepted. They want to be a part of the group. But if their home training is strong enough, they will know, wait a minute, being a part of this group is wrong. So I don't, I need to say no. But children go through what we call, well, what's happening today is bullying. Children are exposed to bullies every day. And, and, we'll, and we'll talk later what develops a bully. Well, sometimes a bully is an insecure child himself. So children are exposed to their peer pressure and children have also a fear of not being accepted and a fear of being bullied. Brother McKinley, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, not 23, 33. <laughs> okay, what does the Bible say? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. What is this, what is this verse saying? Brother um, Sally, can you get me a mic? What is this verse saying? Well, we got, we got a mic coming. Raise your hand if you, if you have the answer to that. Sister Goodwin. Sister Goodwin, up front. Mike's coming. Good morning. It's speaking of bad influence. The kids that are doing the wrong things are having a bad influence on the ones that are trying to do right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very good. Anyone have a different translation than the King James when it's translating this verse? Sister Glenn. Um, 
NLT. Hold, hold it closer to your mic. I can't hear you. Oh. And take your mask down so I can hear you. Thank you. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. That's it. Bad company corrupts good character. You might have a church-going, Bible-sitting child, but if you're not careful, they can be corrupt by bad influence or bad companions in school. Sister Stewart. Um, it's, it's very interesting that the scripture is saying bad influence is good more so than the other way around. Rather that good influences bad more. It's, the scripture is saying if I hang around bad, I will be influenced more by that rather than me in if I were good, influencing the bad. So I think it's very important that we realize the influence and understand how it works. Mm -hmm. Because just because you're good does not mean you will necessarily influence the good, the bad. We need to be very careful about that. You got to be very careful, but also good influence can also change a bad influence. But we have to make sure that the boundary is set and it's not breached. When we train our children what is good and also help them to understand if you breach that boundary, what the consequences could be. Because one thing about consequences, you can never undo it. Once it's done, it's done. You know, once the chicken come out of the egg, it can't go back in. It now starts to grow. But here, here Jack understands that his friends are doing what's wrong, but his Christian home teaching is telling him, I have to be strong to say no. That's one thing we got to tell our children, help our children to be strong to say no. But let's look at Tyler. Now, Tyler also is from a Christian home. Now, what is Tyler's, Tyler's attitude? Brother McKinley. Uh, Tyler comes home after school with red eyes, slurred speech, and coordination difficulties. When asked by his concerned parents what is wrong, he denies everything until finally he blurts out, everybody's doing it. Why do you hate my friends? Both Jack and Tyler come from Christian homes with lots of love and an, an adherence to biblical values. Why did they turn out so differently? Jack's family allowed disagreements between parent and child and gave him practice in the skill of boundary setting, even with them. Jack's mom would be holding and hugging her two-year-old when he would get fidgety He'd say, down, meaning, let me get a little breathing space, ma. Fighting her own impulses to hold on to her child, she would set him down on the floor and say, want to play with your trucks? Jack's dad used the same philosophy when wrestling with his own, whoops, sorry, wrestling with his son on the floor. He tried to pay attention to Jack's limits when the going got too rough or when Jack's was tired. He'd say, stop, Daddy, and Dad would get up. They'd go to another game. Jack was receiving boundary training. He was learning that when he was scared and discomfort or wanted to change things, he would say no. This little word gave him a sense of power in his life. It took him out of a helpless or com compliant position. And Jack, would say, and Jack would say it without receiving an angry or hurt response or a manipulative counter move such as, but Jack, mommy needs to hold you now, okay? Jack learned from emphasis on that his boundaries were good and that he could use them to protect himself. He learned to resist things that weren't good for him. And see, that's how we're teaching our children and setting our boundaries. The purpose of parenting is setting boundaries for our 
children and teaching them how to stay strong in their boundaries. Because we do it, first of all, with unconditional love. Your children will say and do things that will make you angry. Right, sweets? That, that, that's my reaffirmment of uh, child raising. But they will say and do things that will make you angry, but your unconditional love will have you to say, wait a minute, I love my child, and I have to listen to them to see why. Why did you make that decision? Why are you saying what you're saying? Listen to them. Because the same way unconditional love we have to our children is the same as God has to us. God has unconditional love towards us. And we, we mess up. But God don't kick us to the curve. Why do you want to kick your child to the curve? Yes, I'm glad that my parents didn't kick me to the curve. But anyway, and then having that healthy communication. My children be talking to me, and inside I'll be boiling. <laughs> but they don't see that because I want them to feel comfortable to talk to dad or to talk to mom. So here you have to have that healthy communication and not to condemn them before they can get what they're saying out. Let them explain themselves or what has happened before we, you know, bring down the hammer on them. And then at times they will say and do things that will require you to discipline them. But using the appropriate discipline, as they say, the punishment should meet the crime. It should not exceed or go beyond, but there's appropriate discipline that the child needs. And I'll, and I'll say this again because I'm going to say it over and over again. Each child is different. And we're going to see that in a second. Each child is different, so you can't use the same discipline for child number one as you would do for child number three. Sister Harris, wait a minute, Mike's coming. Thank you. Uh, this section is priceless. One thing I, I see, though, when, if you back up, Brother McKinley read, but Jack, mommy wants to hold you now, okay? This shows the parent is needy, and the parent is trying to meet the parent's need. Mm -hmm. And if we mm -hmm. look at ourselves, uh, maybe when you wrestle on the floor and they want to stop, but you don't stop, mm -hmm. you are pleasing self before pleasing the child. And once we look at it from that angle, then we can help them build boundaries better. Right, because one thing, as parents, especially if it's your first child, you just love that child to death. That child said, Mom, give me some space. Turn me loose. Let me get down. But you said, no, I got to hold you, I got to hold you. And you know, but here, you can be, do more harm to the child then good, because here you can be too protective or too clingy that that child cannot wait to get away from you. And then you want to know, uh, how, how come you don't call me like you used to? Because my, I got to get away from you. And also you can cause that child to be too dependent because he's so clingy that he would not be able to survive in cases on his own. So it, it works to the point that you want to keep it healthy, but you want to do it with unconditional love, healthy communication, and appropriate discipline. Raising children, is it fun? Yes, no, yes, no, maybe so. Raising children is challenging, it's fun, and it's also challenging. But it's what God gave us to do. If you want to be a parent, you also signed up for the responsibility of raising that child. Because God gave you the stewardship 
over your children and how you raise them, we have to stand as parents before God and give an account. We talked about that in Ephesians 6. Fathers, provoke not your children under wrath. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So we have to, as parents, we all always get it right, do we? We make mistakes too as parenting. You know, I made some mistakes. But then once I have learned, don't go dwelling on the past, move forward from that. And sometimes, sometimes, parents, we might have to apologize to our children. I did not know my father, because we didn't have that kind of relationship. You know, my father was one of those, he was the dominating. He come in, this is my TP, because, you know, he was half Indian. This is my TP. This is my wigwam. And the, he put fear in us. And I did not understand my father until I moved out of the house, married, and I became a father. And then I began to understand my father, not to imitate his ways, but to understand that how sometimes if you're not careful, and especially with your temperament, how you handle being a father. Some are strong, some are weak. As a father, when you're weak, your family or your household is going to be dysfunctional. Fathers, when you're strong, when you have God in your life, your family is functional and is strong because as Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Okay, let's, let's continue and then I want to move to another slide. A hallmark of Jack's family was permission to disagree. When, for example, Jack would fight his parents about his bedtime, they would never withdrew, they never withdrew or punish him for disagreeing. Instead, they would listen to his reasoning, and if it seemed appropriate, they would change their minds. If not, they would maintain their boundaries. Jack was also given a vote in some family matters. When family hold, hold, night, hold it right there, Brother McKinley. Sometimes it's good to have your children involved in family matters or family decisions, family vacations even projects around the home. Get their input on it. You'd be surprised at how times, sometimes children can give you a good a suggestion that you think, are you a child or an adult? How many of you had your children sometimes repeat back words to you that you said to them? I remember I was going through something one time and I'm always you know, motivating and cheering up my child and my children. And then one of them, I'm not going to say who, because I don't want them to say, oh, Dad, you're talking about me again. Well, anyway, I was a little down, and she says this words back to me that I said to her. And that cheered me up, because that showed that sometimes children can be an encouragement to their parents. Sister Harris, hold on one sec. Let's, let's get a mic. Where's, where's my mic runner at? Sister Harris. Brother McKinley read the paragraph about the Jack's family allowing Jack to disagree, and that sounds so foreign especially if you raise my way or the highway kind of family or something like that. But this is priceless. One, I didn't allow it a lot, but sometimes when they would ask for things and I was kind of on the fence about it, whether to say yes or no, I would tell them, if you can persuade me to think like you, then you can do it. I was up in the air. And that's when we, they practiced uh, the art of persuasion, the art of uh, causing people to think like you want, and teaching them that if someone doesn't agree with you right away, 
you don't yell it louder. That's how I was raised. You yell mm -hmm. it louder. But instead, uh, you think of points that would cause that person to think like you think. And we would practice that when I was up in the air on things. If they couldn't come up with anything, then the answer was probably mm -hmm. no. Well, very good. Because, see, you work with your child, basically, now you use this term, how to debate, how to have a conversation. And, uh, and I would say a mature conversation. Because, see, our children, because of their temperament, we have to discipline them differently. How many of you know your children's temperament? Sister Goodwin, Naisha. Wait a minute, hold it. I, I, I need my mic runner. Come on, Brother Goodwin, move, move, Brother, brother Good's got so much time before they give me the, give me the ax or the hook. You're, you're number one. <laughs> Brother Good, would you say that there is a, a beginning age for when you begin to negotiate with your children? Because at seven, at eight, I'm not negotiating about what time you, you're going to go to sleep. Oh, there's you no negotiating at that time. You have a time that you go to nah, sleep nah, nah. and you go going to bed at that time. Mm -hmm. and I'm not negotiating with you about that. I feel, I feel personally... Like negotiation is for uh, 10, 12, because I guess they're able to reason better and understand mm -hmm. your reasoning better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not saying that a younger child can't understand anything, but they think they're going to negotiate about everything. Mm -hmm. You know, some things, grades, chores, some things, are, there is not going to be any negotiating. It's, there's as parenting. There are some things that's not negotiable. You know, same way as our relationship with God. There are some things that are not negotiable. But as parenting, there are some things that are negotiable because you want to hear what the child has to say. And you don't want to close their spirit that they can't talk to mom or dad. Because, see, when you know your child's temperament, it'll help you better to understand them. Let's look at that. The temperament and the discipline of your children. There are five temperaments. There were really four, but then the National Christian Association or Counseling came up with the fifth, which is supine. The first is a chloric. A chloric is an extrovert. What's, what's an extrovert and an introvert? Right. Right. Very good. So a chloric, one of the temperament is a chloric, and that's an extrovert, and they like tasks. They do better with projects than with people because they like to be the boss. They high energy. They direct, impulsive, impatient, and a chloric child is a strong-willed child. If you have a ch strong-willed child, you might want to think, do I got a chloric? If they're impatient, do I have a chloric? If they want to be the boss, want to tell you what to do, do I have a chloric? Well, that's a chloric temperament. Now, as I go through this, you might see yourself. Because as a child, you take that into your adulthood. The next is what we call, or what they call, is a melancholy. That's an introvert person. They to themselves. They like tasks also. They like projects other than people. But they like to do things, they like things done correctly. They detail-oriented and almost demands a routine. You got to give me a plan. You got to give me a schedule. They not, you know, willy-nilly, you know, they ought, no. You tell me exactly what you want me to do. And they like being by themselves.
they they okay by themselves. Then the next one. Oops, let me go back. Oops, I missed it. I, excuse me, class, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> what am I doing? Come on, brother, good. What'd you do? Oh, there we go. <laughs> then the next one is phlegmatic. They are also an introvert when it comes to relationship. A phlegmatic child likes cooperating, they calm, they slow pace, they like sharing. These children are very easy to parent. You ever have a child that say, boy, I wish all my children were like this. <laughs> but it don't happen like that. But if your child is a phlegmatic, they said that is the easiest child to be to parent because nothing bothers them. And you know, as they grow, you can see phlegmatic adults. Have you ever met a phlegmatic adult? Nothing bothers them. They just as cool and calm. They say these type of temper make, make the best negotiators because nothing riles them up. Then the next child, the sanguine extrovert in relationship, they are all over the place. They are socially active, energetic. They like being outdoors, highly imaginative. They're funny, and they're also mischievous. Sometimes you wonder who's the class clown in, the, in school. That's the sanguine. They love to be around people, and they like to be the spotlight. And then the fifth, which is the supine, the introvert, when it comes to relationship. This is the quiet child. They don't like to make decisions. They're usually the one that's standing in the corner waiting to be called. That's the child that sits in the back of the classroom. Don't raise their hand for anything. But they want you to call on them. They know the answer, but they won't raise their hand. But let's break them down. We have a few minutes, and, and I need to give you the understanding of the temperament breakdown. So as you see your children, it'll give you an idea, say, well, what type of child or what type of temperament does my child have? Let me see if I can move up to this without messing up my slides. Brother, can you take my picture out of the Let's look at, at the chloric style. Remember what we talked about, the chloric? That's as, as, as that child that uh, uh, that's also task-oriented. But their style They'll let you know what they want in a hurry. They don't beat around the bush. They come right out and tell you what they want. They eat and drink fast. As soon as they sit at the table, they just inhale the food because they got things to do. And they determine their own bedtime. Sister Goodwin, that's what, this is a chloric. They tell you when I'm going to bed. No, wait, hold it. You going to bed now. But a chloric will want to negotiate with you because they tell other children what to do. They, they are, when, you, when you see a child in the middle of a group of children telling all the children, you say, that might be the chloric in the group because they like the boss. They like to be in charge. They play well independently. They're okay by themselves also. 
and they ignored the word no where impossible. No. Johnny, I want you to know. They are sometimes very rebellious. And they try to walk early. Here it is. It's, what, what, what's the earliest children usually be walking? Toddlers, I mean children. What's the earliest that, that they normally start walking? Nine months? Well, nine months. Well, if your child's walking at six, seven, and eight months, that lets you know you might, this might be a clerk because they learn and move quickly. And they need to keep busy because they get bored easily. And a chloric child, when they become bored easily, they could become destructive. And they make their own rules. And they like childcare and its competitive activities. They're very competitive. But they also have some extreme behavior. They become impatient with anything slow. Come on, hurry up, let's go. Come on, Dad, Mom, let's go. It's time to go. And they fight to have their own way. And they can become demanding and rude. And can try, and they try to control situations and people. That's a chloric. When you see somebody that's, that's strongly in controlling situations and people, you got a chloric on your hand. You can watch them in the nursery school, and also you can see them in adulthood. And they insist on having the best toy. You cannot give a chloric. Target tennis shoes compared to Air Jordan. Uh, whoa, what? No. That's the chloric. Let's look at the sanguine. The sanguine likes to be outdoors. They don't mind getting dirty, wet, or messy. They're the ones out there playing in the mud pile. They find creative use for common items. They can play with anything. You give them a rock and some sticks, they're having a ball. They show lots of imagination and play. You know, they outside playing, and they can be with someone, of, and they got so much imagination as they're playing. And they can be funny and mischievous. That's at, 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 at uh, that clown in the classroom. But also, they can do some things because what is a child being mischievous? What is he trying to do? Get attention. That's the sanguine. I want attention. They jump quickly from one activity to the next. Their attention span is. They over here now doing something else. And they love to try new challenges. And they need to be able to move and explore. You can't keep a sanguine st still for very long. They got to move. And they change the rules in the game. You know, they change it. Wait a minute, that's not how, well, this is how I'm going to do it. And they liked the creative and entertaining aspect of preschool. They like to be in the, they love people. Now, one way that, that you can discipline a sanguine, how do you think you should discipline a sanguine? If your child's a sanguine, if you know your child's a sanguine, how would you discipline your sanguine child? Sister Harris, where's, where's my mic? Time out chair. Time out chair? Okay. Anything else? Uh, who's that way over there waving? Is that Sister Kearney? 
tell them they cannot go outside, they cannot do that project they want to do, and you will see a difference. Mm-hmm. See, with a sanguine child, you send them to, us, to their room because they don't like being by themselves. But make sure that they don't have the internet or their cell phone in the room with them. Because if they get to other people, they're fine, but they do not like being by themselves. Now, the extreme behavior of a sanguine, they have a knack of getting into trouble. They do what they want regardless of the rules. And they put their own spin on the truth. Now, you know, trying to talk to a sanguine, and, and they got all kinds of spin on trying to tell you the truth. And they put their luck, they push their luck to the limit. That's the one that says if the line is drawn here, they're going to come right up to the line, and then they might jump over it real quick and jump back. But they will push their luck to the limit and they like to create chaos and confusion for fun. That's a bad little child. Is that Sister Stansel? Can you take your mask so I can? Good morning, brother. Um, this is so very interesting and so very useful. Um, but unless I missed it, with the choleric child, you didn't uh, go over the best uh, ways of discipline. Yeah, the way to deal with the choleric child. Well, I'm gonna go back over a choleric child more as we go into our lesson because you, uh, we're gonna go over how to parent a choleric child. Let's go to the next one. A melancholic child. A melancholic child. They care about their appearance. They're neat, well-dressed, well-put. Dr. Davis, come on, brother. What you got to say? Give him the mic, brother. I need you to back up. Take your mask down because you're muffled. I would like for you to back up if you could to one because there's a caution that we need to be careful of with the chloric. Could, could you back up? Okay, hold on. Let, let me see if I can. Oh, I, I mean, no. go ahead, brother. The supine. The supine? The last one you had. No, I'm going to get to the supine later. No. And, what, okay, what, which one did you just have? Oh, okay. Le, the one I just had the was one the sanguine. The, the, one, the one we said the good punishment is to send them to their room. Mm hmm. Wrong. For a sanguine? Yes, indeed. Because if you look at the extreme behaviors, they have a knack of getting into trouble. Don't put them in a room by themselves. Do what they want to do regardless of the rules. They're going to they're gonna rebel against you. Put their own spin on the truth. They're going to lie on you for putting them in the room. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to be very, very careful with the saying because they're so motivated. They, mm -hmm. they, they're so full of energy and mm -hmm. creativity. I would suggest the first thing you do with a saying before you punish them is talk to them and try to understand them. Mm -hmm. And, and like I said, the Esther Sanguine, but also a Sanguine does not like isolation. They don't like it, and that's what makes them rebel against the parent. That's the one that when the police come, they allow on the parent. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, very careful about that. Mm -hmm. but, but you got some excellent points there, brother. You got some excellent points. And, but, but like I said, with a Sanguine, that's, that's a people person. And they like to be around people. And you take something away from them that they like that helps them understand that what I did, mom and dad did not appreciate. So with a sanguine or with any children, if you remove something that they like or they cherish, it will help them to realize their action. And they'll think twice the next time before they would do that. Okay, I got a couple more minutes. Let, 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 let me get to it. And, and th thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, the, the melancholy. They, they get into plan routines easily. They like things planned and laid out. 
and they ask why often and expect correct answers. You cannot finagle or wiggle around a melancholy. I want a correct answer. And they are more atoned to detail why are we doing it this way than any other of the uh, temperaments. And they prefer mental games to physical games because their mind is always turning and challenging. So they like mind games opposed to physical games. And they can focus on one toy or activity for a long time. Yeah, thank you, EJ. <laughs> and they take things apart and put them together, very mechanical. They can take things apart and put it back together. You ever had a child on Christmas Day, and next thing you know, he's got his toy all torn apart? Oh, what are you doing? But then you come back later, it's all put back together. They want to know what makes it tick. And they put things on a schedule. They, they, wanna, they, they are scheduled. Everything is on a schedule with them. And on schedule means on time. They're usually never late. They're early because they have a schedule. And they try hard to follow the rules and do what's proper. You give them rules, they follow to the T. There's no bend in it, so to speak, because they're, they're bringing it to you, but this is the rule, and especially if you made it. So you got a melancholy child, they're going to hold you to your rules. And they like the structure of preschool, and they like to learn. They're good students, because they like to learn. But then there's also the extreme behavior of a melancholy. They assist on special place for everything. Everything has to be in order. Everything has to be organized. Nothing can be out of place and they catch it right away. Mom, well, why'd you move my toy? Because everything has to be in place. And they can be obsessive about what belongs to them. They're very obsessed with what's theirs. And they get very upset if a toy is broken. I, I buy you knowing that I, this is my toy and it's broke. Well, I'll get you now. Nah, I don't care. Oh, this is my toy. And one thing about a melancholy, they worry about things that might happen that never will. Because that's the one they want to see over the hill, around the bend, through the woods to grandma's house because they worry about things that might happen and they dislike their personal space being invaded. They have a strong boundary and if you are familiar or you know a melancholy, you can't get too close in their space because they're very protective. I got a don't give me just a couple more minutes. Now, the phlegmatic, that's the one that I had talked about earlier as the easiest child to parent because phlegmatic cooperates in helping others. They like to help others. They eat, drink, and move slowly. You done finished eating at the dinner table and they still eating. Come on, it's time to wash the dishes. Well, I'm not finished yet. And they go to bed without a fight. It's time to go to bed. All right, good night. And they get pleasure from sharing their toys. And they play well with other children. They make friends easily. They take their time in trying to walk. Boy, you're two years old. You're not walking yet? Why? Wow, you carrying me. They show affection with hugs and kisses. And 
play by others' rules. And they like preschool. But here's the extreme behavior of a phlegmatic. They cry when they are hurt or tired. They let other children boss them around. They whine and beg for what they want. And they can be very shy. And they cling to people who make them feel safe. This is phlegmatic. And then the last one, and then we're going to quit. The supine. The supine. That's the one that very quiet, that sits in the back of the classroom. At times, you don't even know he's there or she's there. That's the child who's always in their room. Come out of your room. You got to ask them to come out of their room. Doesn't like to make decisions. They like to be involved if the decision is being made about them. They like to be dependent on others. They depend on other people. They have a low self-esteem. Life usually fills with anxiety and anger. They have an unlimited ability for service. These make good waiters and porters and people who, who work in hospitals because they have that unlimited ability of service. And they have a high degree of indirect behavior. And what I mean by that, they are easily influenced, good or bad, because they want to be part or they want to be accepted. And they are extremely weak will and can't say no. They take on so many tasks because they cannot say no. And they have a willing heart. One of the most gentle people that you want to meet is a supine. And because they are very gentle. But there's also the extreme behavior of the supine. If they're wronged, they will seek revenge. Which means that if you're married to a supine, you might have to sleep with one eye open. <laughs> they become anxious and angry if not recognized. Now that's internal in them, but they become angry and anxious if they're not recognized or called on. And also for supine, they are easily can be taken advantage of. And they cannot take on responsibility independently and because they can be extremely insecure. These are the temperaments that your child may have one or a combination because also there's a blend. And as you learn your child's temperament, it helps you to understand them and to be a better parent to them because you understand them. Because, don't get me wrong when I say it above, Rupert would say, don't crucify me. <laughs> Some of your temperaments are this, what we just said. Do you recognize your temperament or what I just went over? That's you. That's me. But how we conduct ourselves as a child of God can glorify God and not bring us not bring us shame to God. Because as, 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 as the Bible teaches, the world would know that you are my disciples for the love you have one with another, regardless of your temperament. And some temperament is, it can be used for the good, and some temperaments can be used for the bad. Amen. Class, you've been good. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, but nobody gave me the, the cut. <laughs> But we're going to pick more up about this, but I just want to give you uh, a, an introduction of the temperaments because we're going to go, as we're going more into your child and your boundaries, you're going to see their temperament. And once you understand their temperament, it'll help you to parent your child because if you have, if you have more than one, they're not going to be the same. Let us go to God in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time in prayer. We thank you, dear God, for the blessing that you have given us this day. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing us to see another day, to be able to come out on the Lord's Day, to attend Bible school, and to attend worship service. Heavenly Father, help us as members of the body, as parents, whether we're single parent, that you help us, Lord, to be able to train and to help our children to be strong and to be equipped to be able to go into the world when they're no longer under our roof and in our homes, that they have the knowledge that they need to protect themselves from the wiles of the devil. We pray to God you bless this class, bless this congregation, bless our minister, and bless our ministry leaders. Help us, dear God, to continue to do those things as pleasing in your sight and that we continue to love one another and have compassion one to another. Be with us as we dismiss from our class to go to the morning worship service. Watch over, protect us. Keep us always in your love and in your care. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in your life. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in my life. The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to the Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. Come on, come on, stop on, stop on by. They want to show you love. Come on.